John McMuller on 97.3 ESPN.com, Eagles Insider. My favorite time of the day. Also covers the NFL for Fan Rag Sports. He's put up on the website at 97.3 ESPN.com, the five Eagles to watch in Green Bay. He also talks about on the website about Shelton Gibson finally, as he calls, catching on with the Eagles, catching on that and more. John, how's it going? Doing well. How are you guys? Doing good. So, John, we got the countdown going to the Eagles' first preseason game. It shows you how much we're pining for football that we're counting down to a preseason game. So um, <laughs> let's let's get into some of these guys that you're looking forward to. But I want to start with Deshaun and I were talking earlier. And to me, I never looked at the preseason as an opportunity to see the starters. To me, this is an opportunity to see the guys who, if your starters get injured, what are you working with behind them? And I think that's where the preseason is most valuable is that this is where guys earn job. This is where guys get the opportunity to show that they can be viable backups. So when, and God forbid, if the starters do get injured or something does happen, that they are at least capable of doing the job. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought there's kind of two different ways to approach the preseason. And I got them. One was from... Uh, Danny Green, when I covered him, he kind of thought winning is a habit, uh, and he actually believed if you, if you won those games, it could carry over. And he, he was generally proven to be right over the years. Uh, and then there was the other end of the spectrum, which was Marv Levy in Buffalo, who used to get trounced uh, in basically every preseason game because his mentality was about finding five players basically for the back end of the roster. Uh, and both guys worked out, uh, to be honest, and, and were very successful. So there's always more than one way to look at things, but I think uh, I'd lean more towards Marv and, and the fact what you said, Josh, I, I don't think you, you, you can be worried about the starters at all, especially in today's NFL. It, it, it's about getting the week one as healthy as possible, and it's about finding guys for the back end uh, that are good special teams players and that could potentially uh, step in if, if you do suffer an injury. One of the guys in your five Eagles to watch tomorrow night who I think can also be a special teams guy is C.J. Smith because – For me, between him and Aaron Grimes, I think that both of them have an opportunity here to show that, you know what, we're pretty thin at cornerback, but if you're going to look for depth, we might be the guys that you're going to need to depend on. Yeah, and I I think a big domino kind of fell uh, that people are are just starting to talk about, and that's Tremaine Brock uh, got cleared of his domestic violence case, and he's a free agent, and I think the Eagles are going to be in on him. Uh, as a potential cornerback on this team. Uh, but uh, of the guys that are here, uh, I think it's evident there, there are two specifically that have a chance to sort of push Patrick Robinson for playing time if they don't go outside the organization. And those are two of, two of the guys I, I have on that list, and that's Rasul Douglas, the rookie third-round pick, and C.J. Smith. Those are the guys who are going to be outside cornerbacks that could potentially push for playing time if the Eagles don't go outside the organization. And and a lot of it is going to hinge on how they play in the preseason because if they show signs, maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable and and say you don't necessarily have to get desperate, have to take chances. Uh, So it it is important for players like that, a a preseason uh, atmosphere, and it could also go in a negative direction because obviously you're not going to see Aaron Rodgers at, at Lambeau. So if all of a sudden you're getting torched uh, by Brett Hundley and, and you know, <laughs> Packers who aren't going to be uh, a big part of their offense, well, then, you know, you have a really big concern. John Deshaun, uh, again, we talked le- yesterday about the starters not – not expecting the starters to play a lot or really play more than a series or two. Uh, is Wendell Smallwood expected to be the starter at running back? No, Wendell got uh, injured, uh, so I doubt he's going to play. Uh, he hasn't been able to practice uh, the last two days before. Obviously, they didn't 
uh, have an open practice today, just a little walkthrough. Uh, but the fact that he hasn't been out there, that would indicate you're always going to err on the side of caution. So the guys who haven't been practicing, uh, Smallwood, Nick Foles, Brandon Brooks, none of those guys are, are likely to play. Uh, and even guys who've been out there but been somewhat limited, uh, Alshon Jeffrey being the most notable, I would be stunned if he plays. Even even Donnell Pumphrey, uh, who's had struggles with his hamstring. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of, of of Corey Clement in, in Green Bay, and you know it's sort of a return to Wisconsin for him. So that'll be big, but. Uh, you, you really can't push guys, even if they have a, a little tweak. Uh, so um, the Eagles should and, and are going to err on the side of caution with most of these injured players. John, you write on the website 973ESPN.com about Shelton Gibson finally catching on with the Eagles. Uh, kind of talk about how long far he's come uh, to finally be what the Eagles thought they were getting when they drafted him. Yeah, I, I mean, it might be too late, to be honest, because he was, uh, as I said, he, he was really having a difficult time in the off season and really the first week plus of training camp. And all of a sudden, it, it was that open practice at Lincoln Financial Field. It was like a, a, a light switch turned on for him. And all of a sudden, the guy who'd been dropping, you know, routine balls and, and individual drills starts making spectacular catches, whether it's confidence, uh, whether it's feeling a, a little bit more comfortable. Uh, Shelton seems to have finally turned the corner. But when you look at the 53-man roster and, and, and try to figure out where he fits in, uh, the fact that he was such a slow starter, I, I think Marcus Johnson would have to fall flat on his face in the preseason not to make this team, uh, it's going to be very difficult for Gibson uh, to be on the final 53. And then you have to watch how, how the waiver wire sort of shakes out, and, and ultimately he would be on the practice squad. Uh, but you have to go through that, and there's always a danger that somebody would claim, uh, you know, a, a draft pick in the fifth round, a, a pretty notable name. So is this a good problem for the Eagles I have? I mean, best-case scenario, Shelton Gibson plays lights out and gets it in the preseason. Marcus Johnson plays really well. Uh, I'm hearing rumblings that Bryce Treggs looked okay. Uh, isn't this a good problem for the Eagles to have after last year, the receiving core just oh, never it, getting yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, it's a tremendous problem. This is definitely the most improved position on this football team. They're going to cut a, a good player. They're going to cut maybe two NFL-level players who could play on a roster somewhere. You can even add Greg Ward. Greg Ward's been tremendous uh, this training camp as a slot receiver. Uh, the old Houston quarterback trying to make the transition. Uh, and I think he'll be on the practice squad ultimately. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at the difference between this year and last year, there's no question the Eagles are going to be releasing some pretty good receivers uh, and that's a huge leap forward for this organization. So with John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com, Eagles Insider. Check out his latest article at 97.3 ESPN.com. Five Eagles to watch in Green Bay. You know, John, on this list, you have two cornerbacks, a safety, an offensive guard, and a wide receiver. So the secondary is an emphasis. And based on that emphasis, you mentioned Tremaine Brock earlier. Should the Eagles be already on the phone calling about him, considering the fact that he has been cleared and he's pretty much in the clear? This is a guy who does have talent. Yeah, I, I think they've already been on the phone. I think it's that quick. It's, it's that moving. I got one NFL source that said the Eagles have at least some interest. So I'm trying to get it from a second. Uh, but it obviously makes a lot of sense that this would be one of the first teams on the phone. Uh, because they need significant help at the position. And, and this is a guy who does have talent. And if he comes in here, he's probably the best cornerback on the roster day one. Uh, the Eagles have a lot of confidence, a lot of hope in Jalen Mills. But, hey, you're talking about uh, a former seventh-round pick 
that was rated by pro football focus as the worst cornerback in football last season. So, I, I mean, acting like he's Patrick Peterson, uh, you could cross your fingers, but it's probably not going to turn out that way. Uh, so I think this is one of those situations that has unveiled itself that you could possibly get a player that is above average, really, by NFL standards this late in the process because of extenuating circumstances. Obviously, if there wasn't a domestic violence arrest, he would not be on the street. Uh, on the other hand, you have to deal with, with the PR hurdles. But Jeffrey Lurie has shown in the past that those kinds of things uh, don't dissuade him uh, so if the Eagles do their due diligence, I mean, he could certainly help this football team. Talk with John McMullen. You can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. Covers the Eagles for us, 97.3 ESPN.com. Also covers the NFL for Fan Rag Sports. John, today, Devonta Freeman signed a deal that's reportedly worth $41.25 million, includes $15 million signing bonus, $22 million guaranteed. This makes him one of the highest paid running backs in the game now. His $8.25 million average would exceed running backs like LaShawn McCoy and Doug Martin. We know Le'Veon Bell, he's got that tender for that $12 million. He hasn't signed, he hasn't been in camp. So how does Devonta Freeman's contract extension impact Le'Veon Bell and the Steelers negotiations? Well, they can't negotiate as past the, the franchise tender. So Le'Veon's going to play for that number this season, and then they'll go back into negotiations uh, next year. But it's always going to be a sticking point because in Le'Veon's mind, uh, and, and probably rightfully so, he's the best running back in football, but uh, it, it's a position that's been devalued. If you look at Freeman's contract, it's really you know the same – money that Arian Foster got years ago. Uh, if you look at it from a cap standpoint, it's what high-level running backs were getting back basically a decade ago. So it tells you where everything else has gone up, and, and certainly the salary cap has gone up dramatically because the NFL values the position less, uh, money back contracts have gone down. And, and I understand the frustration, the frustrating part about it for those particular players, but unfortunately it's supply and demand, and that's the market for those guys. Speaking of the Steelers, Mike Tomlin today said, quote, he has no idea, unquote, when the NFL will clear Martavius Bryant to practice. So I ask you, John, do you have an idea when the NFL could clear Martavius Bryant? No, that's always been the biggest problem with the league's uh, policies, whether it's performance-enhancing uh, drugs, whether it's uh, substance abuse or, or even personal conduct, is especially when you get those year suspensions, uh, those indefinite suspensions uh, with these clandestine rules and sort of hurdles uh, the players have to uh, get by uh, to get back on the field. There's no consistency to them. And, and that's a legitimate criticism. But, you know, the league would argue that it, they try. Uh, we, we know from Lane Johnson's own uh, suspension last season, it's not always uh, kept in-house. But they very rarely comment uh, directly because they can't. Uh, mm -hmm. From the CBA standpoint, they can't uh, go on record and talk about these types of issues. So you have this sort of secretive nature about it uh, and the lack of consistency from one case to another, whether you look at Josh Gordon, Justin Blackman, uh, you, you can throw so many names out there, Randy Gregory, nobody knows. And nobody knows until it actually happens. And that includes the head coach of, of a football team. John, I know we're all salivating for Eagles football tomorrow, but there is a game tonight. You know, that should be pretty interesting. You got guys like Christian McCaffrey that should see some work and a guy like Deshaun Watson. Uh, what are some things that you're looking for tonight from those two guys and those two teams, uh, respectively? Well, I, I, hey, I, I'm writing a column uh, <laughs> for Fan Rack Sports tomorrow that 
says the NFL should kill the preseason completely. <laughs> so that tells you what I'm looking for. Uh, it, it, it's just, and even with rookies of that caliber, I mean, they're going to play some uh, because they're rookies and you want to get them engaged and you want to get them in the uniform and in sort of the dress up role of an NFL environment, but there's not much, to be honest, there's not much you can take from the preseason. There really isn't. And certainly not with players that are expected to be stars on your team. And that's what McCaffrey's expected to be from day one. Watson's a little different because uh, obviously as a quarterback, it takes a while to ramp up. So it it probably is a little bit more important for him. Uh, and, And the fact that that team is probably a Super Bowl contender if they get competent quarterback play, whether it's from him or, or Tom Savage or, or anyone. Uh, they With that defense, if you look at it, they were number one in the NFL defensively, and J.J. Watt barely played last year. So if you think about Watt and Whitney Merciless and, and Jadavion Clowney, I, I mean, good luck to offensive coordinators trying to trying to stop those three guys at once. Uh, so, but I, I, I got to be honest. I, I mean, preseason games are, are not meaningful. John, it's interesting you mentioned that because we had Russell Baxter on earlier, and he said that the NFL should cut it down to two games. Today, Roger Goodell came out and said that the NFL should reduce the preseason schedule from four games to three games. So you're the third different person I've heard today say that the preseason is basically too long in some way or another. Why is the preseason four games? Because it's always been that way. It's like a lazy inertia. Uh, (laughs) And, hey, if you go way back, if you go way back, it was six games. You can't even imagine that. But look at the college game. I I mean, they don't even – they're the exact opposite. If you told them, well, you need to play – uh, a preseason game before you go week one. They'd laugh at you. Uh, they seem to do just fine. And, and Bill Belichick, hey, uh, he always says he would rather uh, – he's a big proponent of the of the joint practices uh, where you get teams to practice together. Uh, and the Eagles will be doing that later uh, this summer. But it, it, the reason why is because he says you can script things out you can get together with the opposing coach. You can uh, work on what you want to work on instead of hoping a particular situation comes up in a preseason game. So coaches understand, and, and coaches by and large, they understand they get more accomplished in practice. They'd rather have more practices uh, than preseason games. So everybody knows uh, how meaningless it is, and that's why you hear – Roger Goodell says from four to three, but he he, he realizes that's from the financial standpoint. I, I mean, what these teams do, and it's it's horrible. They they basically bundle the preseason games with the season ticket packages. So to them, it doesn't matter if the seventy thousand seats are half full as long as those other thirty five thousand tickets have been sold. That's significant money. Uh, but a- as I've always said, when you're a $13 billion industry, there's no reason to start pinching pennies a- at the cost of the reputation of your game. And the NFL, a- as you'll see as I write to tomorrow, they should kill the entire preseason. No games. There's no need for any of them, and the college level proves that. John, I'm 70% with you because I I think that the preseason is useless. I mean, the only reason I watch it personally is to see some of the rookies earlier than I would see them because a lot of them won't be playing in the regular season, a lot of the quarterbacks. Uh, But would that hurt the guys that are trying to make the 53-man roster, like guys like uh, Marcus Johnson or Shelton Gibson on this team? If there was no preseason, how would they legitimately have a chance to make the roster? Well, it, Marcus Johnson is a perfect example. If the season started today, Marcus Johnson would make the Eagles roster because of the way he's performed in practice. You're still performing every day. You're still on tape. And in a lot of ways, as I said, coaches find it more valuable because they're doing what they want to do. They're scripting out situations. Uh, they're working on red zone stuff. They're working when the offense is backed up. They're working two-minute drills. In a game environment, you sort of have to hope 
the situation comes up, and depending on, on what portion of the game it is, you may never even get to see Marcus Johnson in, in a two-minute drill or in the red zone uh, because things just didn't work out that way while he and, and his group was on the field. Uh, in practice, as I said, it's scripted. You know the repetitions, and you know he's eventually going to get an opportunity to show. Uh, so every coach I've ever spoken to, to be honest about this, has admitted that practice sessions are more valuable than preseason games. Uh, the one exception to that would be the live aspect of it. Some coaches, Chip Kelly being obviously notable in this town, never had live uh, uh, portions of practice. There was no tackling. So from that standpoint, it was probably helpful for him. But for guys who believe in live sessions like Doug Peterson, he would just take more of those in, in lieu of the games. John, one more question for you before we let you go. It's been the hot button topic today about Josh Rose and the quarterback at UCLA, what he said He's expected to be a hot NFL prospect, and I, I had to chuckle a little bit because I was talking with David Pollack about this earlier today in the show about the fact that, you know, you know, he said so many things in the article that the hot click people, you know, they put it online so they can get clickbait out of it. But the reality is that we always say we want the athletes to say something. We want them to be honest. We want them to be genuine. We want them to be real. And then when a guy comes out, and as brutally honest as humanly possible and says a lot of things that people actually do agree with, everyone gets on him. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's the human nature of people, and you, you just have to brush that off. Uh, I mean, to me, it, it's about, you know, if you're a high-level draft prospect, I mean, it's pretty simple to me. It, it, the NFL has this committee that sort of, you know, rates players uh, and, and tells them where they're probably going to be taken in the draft. And whether you go back to Matt Leiter, we've talked about him in the past, who, who stayed in and it probably hurt him. Uh, if you're going to be a top five pick, you come out. It's as simple as that. So, I, I you know, you, you can argue about if you want to go in another uh, aspect of life, you know, the college environment is great. It might be the funnest time of your life. <laughs> you know, you should sit back and you should enjoy it. Uh, but if your goal is to be an NFL football player uh, and you're going to be a top five pick in the NFL draft, your decision is made for you. You shouldn't overthink it. He, you can follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. He's our 97.3 ESPN.com. Eagles insider covers the NFL for Fan Rag Sports. John, I hope you're able to stay awake for the preseason games tonight. <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee that. <laughs> Thanks, John. Coffee. Coffee is highly recommended. <laughs> All right. Thanks, 